So obviously in, in orthodoxy, well, in East, e, the Eastern Orthodox don't believe in original sin, only that we've inherited the consequences. Yeah, well, don't say they don't believe it. You got to say, depends on how you define original sin. Because you know what original sin means? Yep. What does it mean? So the original sin that's relating to Adam's sin. That's yeah, that means the first sin. Yes. But who committed the first sin? Adam. No, Eve did. Yep. But even she didn't commit the first sin. Who was already a sinner who was sinning against God by tempting them to sin? The serpent. So now notice, you got to be more technical and precise. The first human sin. Yes, it's Eve and then Adam. But yep. the first sinner is the serpent. It's Satan. Yep. So original sin means the first sin committed by any human. The first human sin. Okay, so go ahead. So um, do we believe, obviously that there are differences between yes. the, uh, the Christians. No, I but, don't believe in original hmm. guilt. That was something the reformers taught. Yeah. And I've been told that it was formulated by Augustine. But again, as William has told me and the Catholics can tell me, there are things that Augustine taught that though the Catholic Church respects, they're not bound to Augustine's view, especially when his view is an isolated opinion, not shared by the church universally before him or after him. So mm -hmm. what you're talking about is original gift where Adam and Eve were condemned and their descendants share in their condemnation. So an infant born is born condemned and that must be regenerated. Yep. I don't believe that. Teaching. I don't. I used to believe it as a Calvinist, but that's not in Scripture. There's too many passages in Scripture that show me that children, though born with a sinful proclivity, they receive a sinful proclivity, meaning a sin sinful tendency. They're not condemned or held accountable for it until they're aware of their responsibility to God. And I got that from Scripture. I, when I saw it in Scripture, I go, I can't believe this Reformed doctrine anymore. Okay. Now, you want me to show you the scripture? Yes, please. See, I like that. You never say no. You always want. Yeah, of course. So you're a good man. Let me show you where scripture teaches it, right? Deuteronomy 1, 29 to 39, but because it's a long text, I'm just going to give you 139. Yeah. Okay, so pay attention. What led me to this? And this is, I was seeing it as a Calvinist, and I started having problems. I go, man, how can this be true? How can what the Reformed Calvinists say be right? Uh, it's contradicting scripture. Ready? Yeah. Okay, well, well, did you just sneeze? No, no, not you, man. What do you need attention, Baldy? What is it? He's ready to leave. Uh, no, he changed his mind. He said Sunday, but anyway, yeah. that's rough out there. Okay, take it easy, man. I know you want to throw us out. Let me finish the session. Take it easy. All right, this guy needs attention. Can you give him some love and attention? Love you too. All right, now you ready, mister? Yep, but I'm not because this guy won't, you know, hold on. Hold on. seven. 7 to 14. Okay, now watch. Here God is reminding Israel, reminding Israel. Hold on, let me do this. Can we do this this way? Shut the pile, mister. Why is it not working, dude? All right, here God is reminding Israel that that first generation that came out of Egypt, the first generation, the adults came out of Egypt, they all died with the exception of Joshua Caleb because they remained in the desert 40 years as punishment. Their children who are young are now grown up. Their children entered, not their parents. Why? Here. You ready? Yes. Deuteronomy 1, 39. You ready? Moreover, your little ones who you said would become plunder, and your sons who this day have no knowledge of good or evil shall enter there, and I will give it to them, and they shall possess it. Notice, the reason why your little ones are spared, unlike you who are guilty, and I condemned you all to die with the exception of Joshua Caleb, they were too little to know the difference between good or evil. Mm. See that? Yeah. So that means in God's sight, children who do not know enough to distinguish good and evil are under his grace and in a state of innocence, right? Okay. You seeing it or no? Yeah. All right, here's another one. Isaiah 7, 15 and 16. He will eat curds and honey, talking about messianic child, right? In order that he will know to refuse evil and choose good. 
For before the boy will know to refuse evil and choose good. So here again, we're told that children up until a certain age do not know any better, do not know enough to distinguish right and wrong. And because of that, God looks upon them in pity. Okay, we got it so far? Okay. All right, now, why did he spare Nineveh, the great city, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the kingdom of my ancestors? When Jonah preached, why did he spare it? Do you know why? Because they repented. And not only that, Jonah 4.11. So should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know between their right and their left hand? As well as many animals. There's more than 120,000 who don't know the difference between right and left. And you don't want me to pity them? You want me to destroy them? Okay, got it? Okay. Now, what does Jesus say about children? Matthew 18, 1 to 10. I know all the way to verse 5, but we'll look at it. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself. And set him before them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever, therefore, will humble himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if children are born guilty and condemned, how can our Lord say the greatest in the kingdom are children and you must be a child in order to receive the kingdom? How? If they are condemned, then Jesus is telling us what exactly? These children are the greatest in the kingdom. You must be a child, become childlike, not childish, so you can be great in the kingdom because the kingdom belongs to them. Yeah. Okay. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, is it better for him? That every millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. So you want to be great? Be childlike, not childish. And if you cause these children to stumble, physical children and spiritual babes, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continue to see the face of my fathers in heaven. They even have angels assigned to intercede for them in case anyone harms them. Now, again, Matthew 19, 13 to 15. You ready? Yeah. All right. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. Can you mute your mic? It's <laughs> son of a whiskers, dude. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone. Do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So who owns the kingdom? Children. Who? The children. So how can children be born condemned? Yeah, but does that take away, yes, um, Christ is calling us to be childlike in the innocence and the humanity, but does that change the fact that each child is still born with a corrupted nature, a nature of sin? Did you hear anything I said for the last 10 minutes? Or? I, I did. I'll repeat what I said. But don't we all believe that we're still born? Repeat what I said because I'm going to send you the audio because you didn't listen. Repeat what I said. I, Let's see here. I know. I heard what you're saying. You're, you're saying the Repeat point. Repeat what I said. If Christ is saying that. Repeat the, what I said at the beginning. You got five seconds. The One. kingdom of his heaven is, is like oh, the church. you didn't hear what I said. Two. Three. Four. Now, for the rest of you who are listening, did you hear what I said? I said, we are not born <clears throat> condemned. We're born with a sinful proclivity, with a sinful tendency. We inherit a sinful proclivity, a sinful tendency from our parents, but we're not condemned <clears throat> when we are young and cannot distinguish between right and wrong. See? So this is why this guy's not coming back on my channel. You guys heard it, right? See? Another arrogant. Can I say it? Can I cuss, man? Because I think I got Tourette's. Now, let me finish the thought for the rest of you. Now, look what it says. Romans 4, 15. 
I'm going to finish it for the benefit of the rest of you. Yes, that's what I just said, Nikita. I just said that. Guys, go listen. Okay, send me the link, brethren. I just said that. I just said because of Adam and Eve, their children are born with a sinful bent, a sinful proclivity, a sinful tendency. But you're not condemned to hell because of their sin. Okay, you with me there? Everyone got it? Now watch here to further confirm this. Okay, let me put full screen and I'm going to take the next question. Okay, Romans 4.15. For the law bring, brings about wrath, but when there is no law, there also is no trespass. You see it? If there's no law, there's no sin, right? Can everyone catch it? Romans 4.15 for the rest of you. You guys got it? I can't move on. Okay, that's Romans 4.15. Now, Romans 5.13. Again, Paul says, for unto the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there's no law. Now, you understand what he means? Let me explain this to you. If, I'm going to put it on the screen. Look what he says. There was sin in the world even before the giving of the law of Moses. However, unless and until you're aware of the law, even though you may sin, it won't be counted against you because you don't know any better. You understand what Paul is saying here? Let me break down what Paul is saying here. Okay. Are you listening? Paul is saying that there was sin in the world being committed even before God revealed the law to Moses. Even before the giving of the law of Moses, people were sinning. But because they were not aware of the law, God did not hold that sin against them. Okay, you got it? Why? Because sin will not be counted against you when there is no law. Okay, I got. I want to unpack this point if you're listening. Okay, now why is that important? Because how does this affect children? Here's how it affects children. Romans 7, 7 to 14. Romans 7, 7 to 14. Here how it affects children. These are the verses that made me change my thought about Reformed theology, knowing that Reformed theology is a lie from the pit of hell. All right? Guys, listen, please. This is for you. I'm doing it for you. So you can learn the scriptures. Okay? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? No. May it never be. The law is good. Rather notice, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. I wouldn't even know what sin is if it wasn't for the law telling me. Right? You listening? For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. I need the law to know what sin is. Without the law, I don't know what sin is because sin is breaking the law. But now notice what happens. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment. When God revealed the commandment to me, sin worked out in me coveting of every kind. Did you now catch how Paul is describing sin? Do you now catch how Paul is describing sin? He's describing sin not as simply something you do, breaking the law, but as something in you, as a power and influence in you. you sin worked out in me, coveting every kind. So you see, he's defining sin in two ways. Sin as something you do, break the law, 1 John 3, 4. And sin as an influence and power in you. Well, where did that come from? It came from Adam and Eve, passed on to their descendants. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Notice, when there is no law, that sinful influence is dormant in you. It's asleep. Yep, Ortho, watch here. So when does it awaken? Notice, now I was once alive apart from the law. Ah, oh, Paul is talking about him. Paul is saying that he was alive apart from the law. He's talking about him. When? When he did not know about the commandment. But when the commandment came, sin in me revived and I died. Ah, this is what got me to see that total depravity is a lie from the pit of hell. From Paul himself. See what he just said? I was alive. Sin was dead in me. This sin, this agent, was asleep in me. And I was alive. 
But when the commandment came, meaning when I became aware of the commandment, sin then came to life, sprung to action, and moved me to break the commandment so I would die by breaking the commandment. Okay, we got it now? You guys bored with this? Because I've covered these verses over and over again. But creature repetition, we need to hear something repetitively to become second nature. Did now the light switch go on? Why I don't believe in original guilt? Because it's not biblical. And this commandment, which was to lead to life. See, the law was supposed to show me life. Was found to lead to death for me. But it caused me to die. Why? For sin, taking an opportunity. So notice now he speaks of sin as an influence, as an agent, as a power. So sin is defined in two ways. Sin, something you do, break the law. Sin, something in you, an influence that now moves you to come under God's wrath. Sin, take an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The light switch go on? Did the light switch go on? Did it go on? Do you understand now what the Bible teaches? Paul, again, if you missed it, saying, I was alive apart from the law. He's talking about him. Well, when was he alive? So he wasn't born dead. He was born alive. Because when he was young, he didn't know any better. He didn't know about God. He didn't know about the command. But then when he became aware of the commandment, sin came to life and moved him to break it. And then if you continue reading, Paul then says, the more you sin, the more powerless you become, the more helpless you become. And then sin takes over you so completely that you can reach a level of reprobation where now you are so dead in sin, so encrusted in sin, that now sin becomes second nature like a drug addiction. And when you reach that point, you now reach a level of reprobation where now you have gone to the point of no return. You've now so resisted the spirit and so given into sin, you now blaspheme the spirit and it's over for you. You understand? Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? The law, good, made me die? May it never be. Rather, it was sin. In order that it may be shown to be sin by working out my death. Notice, sin is an agent now. Sin worked out my death. Sin moved me to die through that which is good. And when did sin move me to die? When I became aware of the law, which is good. So that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Then I became aware of how sinful sin is, how evil this agent is within me. Come on, A-Train, don't ask that stupid question. I'll answer it, even though you should know. Common sense. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, having been sold into bondage under sin. That's why he then cries out. Let me read the rest of it. He then cries out. Did it make sense? Did it make sense? Okay, now let me read the rest of it. Because let's finish the thought. Now look what he says. Did you now understand it's original sin, not original guilt? It's not original guilt? All right, let's read. For what I am working out, look what he says. I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. Notice, because I'm creating an image of God. And I have that desire to love God and worship God. I want to worship him. But instead, I keep doing the thing I hate. See, this is, this is a sign you have not reached the level of reprobation. You have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and it's over for you. As long as you're convicted by your sin, as long as you don't want to sin, as long as you want to make God happy, as long as you want to delight him, that means you have not reach the level of reprobation. You're not a reprobate. Because when you are reprobate, that means you've so, not, so angered the Holy Spirit, you've so grieved the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is finished with you and hands you over. But when you reach that point, 
You don't care about God anymore. You don't care about his law anymore. You don't care about sin anymore. You delight in it. You revel in it. That's how you know you're a reprobate. Is it making sense? Are you getting it? Before I move on. Is everyone getting this? So I can finish the point. But notice, Paul wasn't at that point. Paul is saying, I want to do the things of God. But if you are at a point where you don't care about sin, right? And you don't care about God, and you don't care about His law, that means you are now reprobated and sin has taken over so completely. You are now encrusted in sin. And now sin is second nature. But as long as you realize what sin is and you don't want to sin and you grieve, that means you haven't reached that point. Because here, look what Paul says. Okay, look what Paul says. Right here. But if I do the very thing I do not want, see, I'm doing the thing I don't want to do. That means I agree with the law. I love the law. And I agree the law is good. And the law is for my good. Because I don't want to break the law. I want to agree with the law. And when I do break it, I hate the fact that I break it, which means I'm agreeing with the law that these things that I do is not right. And I agree that the law is good. Then what's the story? So now no longer am I the one working it out, but sin which dwells in me. See, now sin is an agent. Sin is an agent. This sin is an influence that's there, part of my flesh, and it will always be fighting with me, wrestling with me, always pushing me to disobey the Spirit, even though I love the Spirit and want to submit. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me. My desire to obey the law is there. My desire to love God is there. But the ability to act upon it is not. Because sin is too strong for me. And the more I give in, the stronger it gets. The more I succumb, the more weaker I get. The more powerless I become. Where now it takes over so completely and I could care less about God and things of God. But he hadn't reached that point. Right? For the good that I want, I do not do. See, I want to do good, but I'm not doing it. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. I don't want to do evil, but I'm powerless. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it out, working it out, but sin which dwells in me. Is it all making sense? Before I finish it and go to the next scholars, then I find then the principle, this animate principle, this living influence, this animated influence, because it's alive, it's animate. It's not something abstract, it's an actual agent. Evil is present. It's present in me, but also the desire to do good is in me. For I joyfully concur with the law of God and the inner man. In my spirit, my heart, I rejoice in God's law. I know it's good. But then I see a different law in my members. Waging war against the law of my mind. And making me a captive to the law of sin which is in my members. Now he's losing hope. Because I can't overcome it. I'm powerless against, against it. Am I doomed? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me? The body of this death. That's when you realize you need Jesus. That's when you realize you need Jesus. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is my Savior. He is the Almighty Son. He has come to condemn sin in me by giving me the Spirit to energize me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I was at the point of despair. And when you saw my despair, you heard my cry and you saved me. That's the good news. See it? You see it? So then he says, so then on the one hand, I myself in my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but under with my flesh, love, son, meaning in my mind, I continue to want to do the law of God, but my flesh continues to do sin. But nonetheless, because of Jesus, 
by the Spirit in me. I'm now empowered by the Spirit, so I'm not left alone. Because the Lord has condemned sin in me and given me the gift of the Spirit to energize me to be able to resist. Okay, now it makes sense. So what was the point of all this? Let's see if you got it. We just saw from Scripture, the Bible is clear. Though we are born with a sinful proclivity, the sinful element influence, when we do not know any better, we don't know the difference between right or wrong, that sin is dormant in us, and it doesn't come to life, doesn't spring to action, to then move us to sin until we become aware. That's why the Bible talks about those who don't know the difference between right and wrong, they're right from their left. But that age depends on each individual, and God knows when an individual is now of sound mind to know his responsibility be be before God. That's known to God. Because it will vary from one individual to another. Is that clear? Do we? Is that clear to make sense? That's the difference between original guilt, where I am born condemned and guilty because of Adam and Eve, and therefore if I die as an infant, I go to hell. That's original guilt. That the guilt of Adam and Eve is passed on to me, so that even as an infant, if I die, I go to hell. That's not biblical teaching. That's not what the early church believed. If you read the writings of the fathers and the theologians up until Augustine, they didn't teach this. And after Augustine, the consensus didn't teach this. Okay, you with me there? So up until now, to answer the question, why baptize infants then? Can I answer that question? You guys want me to answer that question? Because come on, common sense, but let me show you. I'm going to give you an article I want you to read. Because there were Christians who actually delayed infant baptism. Do you know why they delayed it? Here's my article. Guys, I'm going to come to you in a minute. Just be patient. Pray for my health and holiness and my voice to remain strong so I can pass this on. All right? Tertullian, writing in the early part of the 3rd century, the latter part of the 2nd century, said, there are Christians who delay baptizing their infants. Do you know why? You want me to answer that question, folks? He says it right there. He says, there were many Christians who wouldn't baptize their infants. They delayed it. Do you know why? Because they believed water baptism makes you alive spiritually, unites you to Christ, and if you commit any sins, they'll be removed. So they reason like this guy. Well, hold on. Infants are born innocent. Why don't we wait until they're mature enough so that when they sin, they can be baptized and forgiven of their sin? See, so they use that reasoning. So they deliberately delayed water baptism because they wanted the children to be able to be forgiven of their sins through baptism. So they would delay it with that reasoning. So then why do you baptize infants today? Well, let me explain it. Without water baptism, you will not be born of the Spirit, united to Christ, made one with Him. But aren't innocents under grace? So if they die, aren't infants under grace? So if they die before knowing right or wrong, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the blood of Jesus will be extended to them? Yes, I believe that. So they don't need to be born of the Spirit. Well, hold on. You assume that the Lord has given you a child that will live out a full life. That's the assumption. We don't assume our children will die. We assume that they will grow up and mature and live relatively full human lives. Because of that assumption and belief, we baptize them as infants so that already they are members of the body of Christ, so that you can give what they call pedo communion. So you can give infants or children communion. Or that when they do mature, they're already united to Christ and they can then receive the benefits and the blessings of the sacraments. You understand why we do it now? You understand why? So my assumption, my faith is, my daughters will outlive me. 
And on that basis, I want them to be born of the Spirit right away and united to Christ right away. And they can receive these graces of our Lord. So later on, when they mature and they realize between right or wrong, they're already united to Christ of the Spirit. So they don't need to be baptized to become one with Christ. All they need to do then is confess, repent, and do what the church requires. You get it now? That's the logic. That's why. Because in water baptism, Spirit comes upon you, makes you one with Christ. So yes, children are innocent. And if they die in innocence, they are covered by the grace and blood of Jesus. That's why infants and young children who are born in Hindu homes, Buddhist homes, my belief is the Lord loves them all and has mercy and extends the saving benefits of Christ to all of them. So you're going to see children who were born in Hindu families, Buddhist families, Jewish families, all there, covered by the blood of Christ, where the saving merits of Christ were extended to them. You understand the point? That's what I believe from Scripture. I may be wrong. It's what I see. But when you have children born in a Christian home, you baptize them to give them a head start right away. They are one with Christ already, so that you can then administer Pado communion and all the other sacramental graces that are only given to baptized members of the church. Okay? You understand now?